Good afternoon. I'm Jill Dawson, an educator, artist, and maker in the MATT program. While I'm no longer a classroom teacher, I still work with students and other educators by teaching workshops related to educational technology with an emphasis on making things, which has been a passion of mine since I was a kid. Back in the fifth grade, I made my first book. And although it was constructed with wallpaper scraps and a sewing machine, I've kept it after all these years because there's something powerful about making marks in a book that you've made with your own hands. By design, a physical book is durable and tangible, a symbol of self-expression, knowledge, and connection. But what if something as simple as a book could be more than a source of learning or a place for a private thoughts, but a smart object? A smart object that could connect to the World Wide Web to help tell a story. Welcome to Electronic Notebooks and the Internet of Things. In the summer of 2014, my journey at Marlboro began with a spark. Wanting to take a hands-on course, I'd signed up for Lucy Delabrier's Create Make Learn Summer Institute, held at a Burlington makerspace called The Generator. I hadn't yet had my morning cup of coffee, but after visiting the registration table, I was handed a coin cell battery and an LED and instructed to go light up my name tag. After fumbling around nervously with these foreign objects, I had created light and my life would never be quite the same. Just as a good book can alter the way a person perceives the world, the same may be said for new experiences. I had created my first circuit and the result was a jolt in my thinking. That experience led to my discovery of paper circuitry, an idea popularized by MIT doctoral student G. Key. While Create Make Learn was going on in Vermont, an innovative group of educators out of California, in collaboration with G and the National Writing Project, was launching a broad initiative called Hack Your Notebook Day or the 21st Century Notebooking Project. The idea being that electrical circuits on paper could be used as a multimodal writing tool. Imagine a journal that combines writing with light as a medium of personal expression. Using a few simple supplies, paper circuitry offers students an engaging way to explore electronics as part of a portable, customizable, physical object. I quickly fell in love with paper circuitry because it blended my passion for the arts with a newfound desire to integrate electronics with traditional bookbinding. Plus, it turned out to be a great teaching tool. Because of its low barrier to entry, a second grader can learn the basics of it. Because of its limitless potential for complexity, it's appealing to older students as well. As a result, paper circuitry is increasingly finding its way into classrooms and art studios, and practitioners are continuing to push the boundaries by adding sensors and programmable chips into their projects. That same summer, another MIT student named Natalie Freed created a field journal that could receive real-time data based upon the position of the tides to control circuits in her book. Imagine that. She figured out a way to use information freely available on the web, in this case, tidal data, to create an electronic visualization of tides on the pages of a book. But when I first laid eyes on this masterpiece, I was still new to paper circuitry and coding. And while I was inspired to figure out how she'd gotten her notebook to communicate with the internet, I still had a lot to learn before I could jump into making something that complex. So over the next two years as a Marlboro student, I worked on building my skills as an instructional designer while learning more about paper circuitry in the process. I created instructional videos about paper circuitry, a podcast and an online course on the topic. I wrote a literature review and even explored paper circuits as part of an action research project at a local middle school. But by the time I felt confident enough to circle back to the idea of making my own Wi-Fi connected book, I discovered that little documentation was available to help an ordinary person, not a computer scientist, to achieve that. A step-by-step -step reference guide did not yet exist to help novices take their skills to the next level, connecting a book to the web through the global network referred to as the Internet of Things. As a result, I saw an opportunity for a capstone project that would allow me to demonstrate my learning at Marlboro as both an instructional designer and a tinkerer. 
I could figure out how to design my own Wi-Fi connected book and share my process with others so they might build upon my work. By doing so, I hope to explore ways that paper circuitry might extend the construction of new learning in science, technology, engineering, math, and the arts so that it might be replicated by students of different ages. My deliverables then would be a completed book, weekly blog posts documenting my progress, and a how-to guide that others might follow. So how did I get there? Before I could teach anyone else, I had to do a lot of tinkering to figure out how it might be done. In the spirit of Sylvia Martinez and Gary Stager, I needed to invent to learn. My first step was to learn how to use a photon, which is basically a tiny computer that can be programmed to do a lot of things, such as recording data from a sensor, through commands sent over the internet. Gradually, I learned how to control a small motor, play music on a tiny speaker called a buzzer, and change the colors and patterns of light. After lots of experimentation, I figured out how to use a quick response or QR code to trigger different behaviors on the photon. QR codes or quick response codes are machine readable barcodes that are used to store information. A person with a smartphone can scan the code to retrieve the information, such as a link on the internet, which in turn sends a signal back through the internet that can trigger a reaction on a small computer, such as a photon. Each day, I learned something new until I finally merged several small programs called functions into one big program, which would allow me to control the animations and effects of six different pieces of art in my book. While playing with code and prototyping with alligator clips, I was imagining how I might design the paper circuit in my book. I created covers using binders board and a pen knife. This design worked well for embedding the photon in a rechargeable battery. I practiced building my circuit using a photocopy of the book. Once I had a workable design, I laid down copper tape, soldering each piece to a single pin on the photon. In case you might be wondering, the pins are the small circular pads which can send and receive electrical impulses. Before I could sew the book together, I needed to know which pins needed to go on which page to match the programs or functions that I'd written. Remember how the Tide Notebook used title data? Well, this piece of artwork was triggered using light sensor data. When the light sensor on one photon detected darkness, the owl's eyes and flickering candle would turn on on the photon that would be embedded in my book. Since this was what I'd initially set out to learn, how to get internet-connected data to trigger a reaction in a book, I was thrilled. In my next piece, I figured out how to get sensor data from a weather station in my hometown to trigger a reaction on my photon. When it started to snow in Westford, the twinkling lights on this page simulated a snowstorm taking place in real time. This was similar to the use of tidal data in the Tide Notebook. But by this point, I was having an epiphany. Using data to trigger the functions, or mini-programs, in my book wasn't super practical in this context for storytelling rather than data visualization. If I used actual weather data, the only time a reader would see this reaction in my book would be if it was snowing in Westford, but I wanted readers to be able to see it while they were reading the story. So I eventually settled on using quick response codes to trigger the functions illuminating each piece of artwork because it gave a reader control over their interactions with the book. In this piece of art, for example, leaves falling could be triggered by Westford's wind data or a QR code. In this piece, a viewer could change the color of lights by scanning a QR code. In this piece, I used math to program the rhythm of the music that plays when a QR code is scanned. And this is probably my favorite page because the fading fireflies escape like the ones in my daughter's writing. One of the best things about this project was the ability to collaborate with my daughter, Audrey whose poetic stories came to life on the pages. 
I chose to document and share my work by creating a how-to guide called an Instructable. For those of you who may not have heard of it, Instructables.com is a website where people teach each other how to make and do a variety of things. I chose this medium, which I learned about in Rick Aller's instructional design course, because of its format, which allows a creator to upload video, images, and text to help a learner work at their own pace. The biggest challenge in creating it is simplifying the process enough to make it possible for someone else to replicate. I had to be mindful of what was essential to prevent cognitive overload in my viewers. I won't be 100% certain that I've achieved this until someone leaves me feedback letting me know that they were able to create their own book based upon my instruction. And although the topic of creating a Wi-Fi connected book fills a rather narrow niche, I was excited when my instructable was chosen to be featured on their Arduino and technology pages. I also shared my work with a 21st century notebooking community, a vibrant community of paper circuitry practitioners who routinely share their work on Google+. So far, the feedback has been encouraging, and I'm hoping to continue building upon this work, perhaps in collaboration with some of the people that I've connected with through the community. While I was illustrating my first book, I started working on my next iteration using book covers made with a laser cutter. My second Wi-Fi connected book had some improvements. It used more durable materials, for example, and features nine animated illustrations instead of six. But while my first book was filled with love and collaboration with my daughter, my second one was a reaction to change and uncertainty. And while I started out using the same code that I'd written for my first book, I ended up modifying it to achieve different effects. And while my second book was more about artistic expression than technical exploration, I still managed to experiment with different structures, such as illuminated pop-ups. This one, perhaps ironically, plays the tune, This Land is Your Land. And while this wasn't a direction I'd planned on going, the process of engineering pop-ups that light up when a QR code is scanned was liberating. And once I felt comfortable using the technology as a tool of self-expression, I found myself innovating with ease and imagining ways I might build upon all I'd learned. Might it be possible to create a choose your own adventure book using this technology? That remains to be seen. Paper circuitry provided a launching point that catapulted me into a deep exploration of coding and the mysteries of the internet, but it was my courses at Marlboro that allowed me to practice the principles of connected learning, instructional design, and design thinking by inviting me to create, make, and learn based upon my own questions and passions. As I conclude my story, which began with a simple circuit, I'd like for you to imagine a world where all students have the opportunity to learn through experimentation and play, where all students are able to learn complex skills and concepts and express themselves through authentic applications of science, technology, engineering, math, and the arts. While the materials used will continue to evolve, that would be a story worth telling and a book worth making. Thank you, Marlboro.